All right, hey, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. Come on. Amen. Whoever's joined us online as well, thank you so much for joining us for the last installment. We're in part four of this series called Relationship Rehab. And men, do our relationships need some rehabilitation? So we started the series several weeks ago, and we talked about kicking it off with a friendship rehab. And, and maybe we're, we're the way that we're doing friendship and friending and community, maybe it looks more like the world and not like the word. So maybe we just need to rehab the way that we're doing life together and we're walking in community. So we talked about a friendship we have. We talked about a marriage we rehab a couple weeks ago. And then last week, every parent got beat up with a parent rehab. Amen. It was a great word though. What a great word. I was so convicted. I was like 18 years too late. No, I'm just kidding. But maybe, <laughs> where were you at, Pastor Sean? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, today, today, um, we're going to, we're going to, how many of you already study the Word of God? I want to dig into the Word of God. If you do have your Bible, we're going to be in Mark chapter 5. That's going to be our primary text that we're just going to dig in today. And I want to show you some, some, some rhema, some revelation today. But let me start with this. Let me start with a question. Second to Jesus, what do you think is your most important relationship? Now, don't get all like the Holy Spirit, the Father. Come on. Second to God, second to God, what do you think is your most important relationship? And you might be thinking of a few different things, but I'm going to try to convince and convey to you that the, actually the most important relationship second to God in your life is yourself. Yourself. The title of today's message is self rehab. We're going to do a rehab of ourselves, And I wasn't meaning or intending to go here. I just felt like the Holy Spirit wanted us to deal with some things because the greatest enemy you will ever face is yourself. And you do have an enemy. You have an adversary. His name is Satan. But, but the reality is he can never take us back into his kingdom. But self is responsible for most of the evil, the sin, and the dysfunction in your life and in your relationship. You can bind and loose all you want. You can decree and declare till your breath is just running out. But if you don't work on you, it ain't going to make a difference. Okay? I was just teaching this principle to our leaders in our school of leadership last week. I was teaching a principle called the mirror principle. The mirror principle. It's like before you are leading others and trying to have healthy relationship with others, the first person that you need to examine is yourself. You need to look in the mirror. Okay? So, so the first person I must get along with is myself. Self-image. I'm gonna give you some extra stuff I was teaching our leaders. Is that okay, you guys? Okay, the first person we, that causes us problems is myself. That's called self-honesty. The first person uh, that I must change is myself. That's self-improvement. The first person that can make a difference is myself. That's self-responsibility. And the first person I must know is myself. That's self-awareness. Now, there's a big difference between self-awareness and self-centered. When I say second to God, the most important relationship is yourself, I'm not advocating for self-centered life. I'm advocating for a self-aware life. There's a big difference. Self-centeredness puts you in the middle. Like everything is about you. Everything in your life is interpreted through the lens of your feelings, your opinion, your desire. So it's all about you. It's self-centered. But self-awareness simply says, I know who I am. I know what I am. And I know where I am. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know where I am. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know where I am. Now, that identity is, is that position, that posture, that place. It's a never-ending journey to kind of locate yourself through all the stages in the twists and turns of your life. Because who you are, where you are, and, and what you are tends to change and is challenged. You're a young adulthood, and then you become a man, and then you become a husband or a father and, a, and an employee, and then, and then a servant and then a servant leader. And, a, and there's all these changes that you go through your life, and it becomes challenging to find out again who I am, what I am, where I am. In fact, from the moment... Humanity was fractured. Identity was fractured by the original sin. God has been on a mission to restore what was broken, both inside of us and with him. The original sin happened, as many of you know, 
with mankind in the Garden of Eden, with, with Adam and Eve. They rebelled against God, and immediately when they did that, their identity was fractured. They felt guilt and shame. They no longer knew who I am, what I am, where I am. So they covered themselves, remember, and hid in shame. But they, that not only, not only affected their own identity, it affected their relationship with their fellow man and their intimacy with God, all because they didn't know who I am, what I am, and where I am. And God takes the initiative in Genesis and began a plan of redemption that begins in Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, all the way to the resurrection of Jesus. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Then the Lord God called to the man, hiding. He says, Where are you? Now, this was more than a longitude and latitude question, you guys. This, he, he was not asking this question to figure out the geography of Adam. He didn't need to know like exactly. This, this question was posed for man, not for God. Where are you was the question more spiritual and more emotional. And that's my question to you today as we go through a self-rehab. Where are you? Not like where, where are you sitting and like, oh, I'm, I'm, this is where I work. And I'm not saying what about you. Where, where are you? Can you locate yourself today? Do you know who you are, what you are, and where you are? Like if you were to answer that question, maybe even some of the spaces in your, in your note today, if you take out a pen and just begin to think, where are you? are you? Are you sad? Are you frustrated? Are you lonely? Are you hopeless? Are you discouraged? Are you unsettled? Are you afraid? Where, where are you? Now, in, in our text today, in Mark chapter 5, there's a woman who is broken, who's ashamed, who's afraid, who'd been suffering for 12 years years and she tried to find comfort and healing in so many places but she hears about these miracles and these changed lives and thousands of people from this rabbi this Jesus of Nazareth that's coming around her scene and territory so she thinks to herself if I could just get close enough to touch him I could be healed I almost called this message today close enough to touch him close enough to touch him what if what if I got close enough to touch him. What would happen if I got close enough to touch him today? We're going to back up in this story in Mark chapter 5, starting with verse 21. Verse 21 today. It says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell down at his feet, and he pleaded earnestly with him, and said, my little daughter is dying. I can't imagine the pain that he's going through. Now at the feet of, of Jesus, begging for the life of his daughter. Please come and put your hand on her so that she'll be healed. So verse 24 says, Jesus went with him. I want to pause for a moment and just deal with this. Because to skip over Jairus' story would not do this text Justice, even though Jairus is not the assignment of my preaching today, uh, I do want to point out, though, that there are certain situations that will make your position in life irrelevant. There, there are certain things that you will come up against and you will encounter in your life that it does not matter what they call you on the job. You could be the CEO, supervisor, president, or boss. It doesn't matter if you can occupy a high position, you will be brought to low places. That Jairus is a synagogue ruler. He's a, a person of, of influence who has been brought low. And if you live your life long enough in here, anyone probably over 12 years old would realize that, that you will, no matter how much you make or what you have in your home or what kind of, it doesn't matter those things. You will encounter things in your life that no matter how you are, you will be brought low by some things in this life. And so Jairus comes to the only one who could actually do something about it. And, and I just wonder if God has brought you to this position in your life where the things you used to try aren't relieving the trouble anymore. So he comes to Jesus, and this isn't the point of my message today. What I'm going to preach on is the, is the interruption to Jairus' miracle, uh, which, you know, I, I, I mentioned this only to, to point out because that sometimes miracles happen in the middle of the other thing that you thought was important. Did you ever notice that? When, like, God doesn't work on your timetable, Jairus is asking for Jesus a miracle, and 
On the way to that, he gets interrupted, and then that story of the interruption becomes the main purpose of the text that Mark is writing. Look what it says in verse 24. So Jesus went with Jairus, and a large crowd followed and pressed around in verse 25. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, she wasn't bleeding from her nose. You couldn't see her blood. She was not bleeding externally. You could not see where she was bleeding because she was bleeding internally. And no one sees where some of you are bleeding. That's a lonely feeling. No one knows what's dominating you and depresses you. They only, sh they only see what you show them, and your social media feed is clean, isn't it? They don't see where you're bleeding. That, that, they don't see your depression. That's a tough place to be. I wonder where you're bleeding that nobody sees today. I wonder where you're hurting that nobody has heard. You may generalize it. You, say, you might say things like, pray for my job and pray for my kid, but that's what everybody sees. But internally, you're like, you, you don't know if you can make it. You don't know if you have what it takes. You're doubting yourself. You're doubting your capacity, your ability, your identity. You think you're a failure, and you're bleeding on the inside, and no one can see it. Come on, are you hearing me today? Am I, am I okay to preach like this today, you guys? Verse 26, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, who had, and she'd spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, look at this, she got worse. Have you noticed that yet in your life, that the things that you're going to, to try to feel better are actually just making it worse? Okay, have you ever ate something to feel better? Come on, somebody. And it did for a little bit, right? That felt good for a little bit until 1 a.m. <laughs> She's running to things, running to people that promised to make it better, and it actually made it worse. Verse 27, until she heard about Jesus. I love to tell people about Jesus. I love to preach Jesus and lift Jesus up. But she didn't get the healing because she heard. She didn't get, she didn't get it because she took good notes in church. Come on, you can go to the small group, freedom group, foundations class, and get worse. She didn't get healed because she heard. That was the first step. Don't get me wrong. I want you to go. Please take notes, all right? I want you to take some notes. I want you to go to the group. I do. But, but I think it's actually a good thing to put yourself in the path of the promises of God, to put yourself in the path of the word of God. But that was the first step. She continued. She didn't, she didn't wait to get a touch. She said, I'm going to go touch God myself. Okay, she because she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because look what it says. She thought. She heard, she came, she touched because she thought the power of a thought. And just like her bleeding started on the inside, so too did her healing right here with a thought. And here was the thought. She said, if I just touch his clothes, if I can just get close enough to touch him, I know I will be healed. Verse 29, and immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt the difference. Immediately she felt something shift and change on the inside of her. Immediately she knew she'd been set free from her suffering. So I wanna, I wanna teach from this today these four habits of healthy people. That if you do these, if you do these, not only will you heal what's broken and what's bleeding inside of you, but I think what you'll discover is your relationship with yourself is actually the best thing you can do for your relationship rehab. That maybe it's not a relationship externally that needs to get fixed. Maybe God wants to do something inside of you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says it like this. It is in Christ. Somebody say in Christ. It's an important phrase in the New Testament. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. You know the word Christian is only used two times in the entire New Testament. We'll use it. We'll say Christian, follower of Christ, or believer. Those are popular terms. But in their time, in biblical time, this was the phrase that was used, in Christ. It's actually used 89 times in the New Testament to, to classify our position, who we are in Christ. And, and 79 times it says, in Him. So, so the, it's, it's important that if you want to know who you are and what you are and where you are, that you find yourself in Christ. So let me give you four things today for your relationship rehab, four habits today, that if you want to heal what's broken and bleeding and maybe even uh, uh, the best thing you can do for your relationship rehab is to reprioritize yourself. Number one, care for yourself. 
in Christ. You got to learn how to care for yourself in Christ, okay? Now, I'm not saying you don't need other people. You need other people. We need, we need other people to care and support from each other. But if you do not know how to care for yourself in Christ, then you will be dependent upon other people to do something for you that they were never really intended to do. One of the therapists at our Discovery Counseling Center, they said re recently, they said, maybe it's not so much about self-care as it is about surrendering yourself to the care of Christ. Maybe there's things that we're doing in the, in, in the name of self-care that's not making us better. It's making us worse. Mark chapter 5, 26, remember, look what it says. She had suffered a great deal under the, under the what? Under the care. They were supposed to care for me. I thought this was it. I thought this was a solution. They were supposed to care, and they didn't care. They didn't care for me. I, was, I wanted care. They were supposed to care, but they didn't care. They, he, she suffered under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Sometimes I, what we think is better has no grounding in reality. I like Mark's gospel here because, because he says, you know, it, they made it worse. You know, the doctors she went to made it worse. Luke, these, this story is actually in the other gospels. Luke is a physician, and Luke tells the same story from a physical standpoint, though, from that physical perspective. But he says it like this. He says, no one could fix her. That's what he says. No one could fix her. But I like Mark telling, Mark's retelling of the story because Mark seems to imply here that there were some people who were supposed to care but didn't really care that we're actually taking advantage of her. There, Mark seems to imply that the motives of everyone she went to weren't so pure and weren't so clean and weren't so clear that maybe Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok don't really care for your inspiration. Maybe the news that you're watching doesn't really care about informing you. Maybe that, that they don't really care, but there's an ulterior motive behind the scene working. Maybe the things that we're going to for our entertainment and our social engagement and information, maybe their motives aren't really to care for me. Is the stuff you're going to making you feel better or is it getting you better? Notice it didn't say that she wasn't feeling better because she might have felt some temporary relief, but she didn't get better. What are you going to that makes you feel better but not getting you better? I wonder. I wonder what you're going to. That makes you feel better. There's, there's a few things I'll share with you, just, just three maybe, that, you're, that you go to, to to feel better, but it doesn't get you better. One is comparison. See, the temptation to compare is so close. It's as close as your next chat with a friend, your next trip to the store, your next check-in on social media. And I'm telling you, it's never-ending and it's exhausting because no matter if you come up on top or you're on the bottom, you it is it's it's a trap. It's a no-win situation because comparison will either make you feel superior or inferior, and either position dishonors God because when you don't measure up, you feel envy and jealousy take root because your kitchen was fine until you saw her upgrade. I didn't know they made a fridge like that. Did you see that fridge, honey? We need that fridge. Look at that fridge. You need a new fridge now. But when comparison ends up in your favor and you end up on top, you get pride and ego that takes root. And it's a trap and because, because she could lose weight if she exercised like you did. And it makes you feel better when you end up on top, but you're not getting better. In fact, comparison makes you worse, doesn't it? How about this one? How about consumption, which is the most common self-care habit to consume? Consume? How many of you eat your feelings? You eat your anxiety. You eat your depression. You eat your bad day. You eat, you just, you eat it. You drink it. And it's like, I deserve this. I, I deserve this. You tell yourself, I deserve this. And you may feel, be, feel good for, and better for a little bit, but it's not making you better. It's making you worse. Okay? Consumption. How about this one? I'll give you the last one. Compulsion. Compulsion. That's our cravings, our desires. When you are... 
the most stressed and you need a break and you're at your weakest emotionally and mentally and you're drained, it is easier to give into your compulsions in that state. It is so much easier to compromise and give into your cravings when you're in that place because you told yourself you'd never look at porn again, but in that place, you go to a craving that's gonna make you feel better, but it ain't getting you better, it's making you worse. And you wanna get a quick fix and you need to feel better real quick so you go to a craving a compulsion that makes you feel better in the moment but you ain't getting better you're getting worse what if though this woman she tried to fix her issue and only made it worse but what if we catch the thought that she caught do you remember that thought she caught she was like i tried it all and then she caught a thought she said but what if i what if i got it close enough to jesus that i could that i could touch him because cause I, I need healing. I need revelation. I need, I need, I need, I'm suffering. I need recovery. And where I've been running to isn't making me better. It's making me worse. I'm going to care for myself in Christ. I'm going to go get a touch. Come on, somebody say amen. I'm going to care. I got to learn how to care for myself in Christ. Number two, love yourself in Christ. I never had that on a point. I don't think I ever said that as in, in my years of preaching. I never said, love yourself. But here I am, the 44-year-old version of me that's like, no, this is, this is important. God, love yourself in Christ. And some of you are thinking, isn't that contrary to the Bible? Absolutely not. No. If you want to learn to love well, it actually starts with loving yourself. And this is, I'm not talking about self-love. Uh, this, this is a revelation of God's love for you. Let me just, some of you are like, but that's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. Let me show it to you. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus replied to the question, what's the greatest commandment? Remember that? And he replies like this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And here's the second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor. Say those last two words out loud with me. Love your neighbor. Oh, oh, oh. I, I love my neighbor like I love my Self, listen to me, here's what Jesus is saying. People who struggle to love their neighbor struggle to love themselves. We, we have a saying, right? You've heard the saying, hurt people, hurt people. So you need to learn how to love yourself in Christ. I was talking to a group of people. These, it was like different couples, married couples, men and women. When we were talking about how cool it is that we have wives, we all have wives that, that help dress us. Come on, man. How many of y'all, okay, how many got some wives that help dress you? Okay, so we were just talking about how thankful we all got some wives that keep us, keep us um, you know, current, okay? <laughs> so, um, and, and, and so we have this thing. I got this thing, and I found out, they got, I, I'm like, hey, you got, you know, do you ever do the, like, after you get dressed? Because I'm a man. I dress myself, even though, you know, I dress myself. But I have a situation. After I dress myself, I do a fit check. Come on, so I basically stand in front of your wife and just be like, honey, honey, honey. She's getting herself right. I'm a honey, honey, fit check. <laughs> Is it good? It's good? Okay. Green light. Sometimes I got to go back to the closet. I got to rework that thing. Come back, fit check. Okay? And so we were just talking about this, and, and one of the ladies, one of the ladies kind of spoke up, and, and, and she goes, I don't even look in the mirror in the morning. And that shocked me. Like, how do you get ready without looking in the mirror in the morning, and so I looked at her, and I asked her, do you not care what you look like? Or, and then the Holy Spirit spoke to me, or do you not like what you look like? And, and she paused for a moment, and she was like, all I see is what's wrong with me. So if, when I do, I don't look long. Hey, do you love yourself? Do you like what you see? In that mirror, look, this religious law at this time required this woman with this issue of blood to announce herself whenever she was around people. And if she didn't announce herself, other people announced it for her. And here was the announcement, unclean, unclean. And people would scatter from her. 12 years she's been hearing this, unclean, unclean, getting the rejection and the stares and the label put on her. It's only so long that, that you take that kind of rejection that you start to see yourself through the lens of what other people think you are. But a key element to loving well is understanding how to love yourself. And it's not about self-love. It's, it's a revelation of God's love. Look at it in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love... Because he first loved us. Maybe we need to look in the mirror and get more comfortable 
with the person we see. Maybe we need to get a revelation of God's love for me. Maybe I need to see me the way God sees me. Stop looking to other people for what only God can give you. We need to stop looking to other people to define you. They didn't create you. They don't have the power to define you. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Let me come back to that. You gotta, but you got to care for yourself in Christ. We got, we, let's learn to love ourselves in Christ. Number three, share yourself in Christ. Okay, we're going to pick back up the story here because it didn't end. It doesn't end. It doesn't end with her healing. There's more. Jesus was not finished with her when, he, when she got her healing because remember verse 29 said immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt it in her body and she was free from her suffering but it picks up verse 30. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He noticed something was released. Power was released and he turned around to the crowd and asked who touched me who touched my clothes and the next verse the disciples were kind of kind of confused they were like you see all these people crowding against you yet you ask who touched you a bunch of people are touching you right now jesus but jesus knew there was a different kind of touch that power was released there was a faith touch something was released from me just who touched me so the next verse says but jesus kept looking around to see who had done it? He continues, who touched me? Who touched me? Who touched me? He keeps looking. She tried to get her healing and then sneak away in the crowd before they picked up the offering. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, I got what I came for. I don't like these people. They don't like me. I'm just going to go ahead and sneak out before the final announcements. No, I'm just... <laughs> but, and Jesus, Jesus is looking through the crowd to find out the one who power was released. It was a different touch. Who touched me? No, 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 no. Who touched me? Who, who touched me? Jesus kept looking. Apparently, now I'm, I'm going to say something that might, might shock you. Don't, don't stone me up here. Apparently, Jesus didn't know who touched him. Okay, before you freak out on me, listen, Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. So either, either let's, let's, let's interpret this text. Either Jesus was you know, lying. He was like manipulating the situation. He was all, who touched me? And he really knew. And he's all side on her. Who touched me? <laughs> and he really knew. So either Jesus was even being manipulative or Jesus was authentic to who we, who we know him to be, authentic. So what appears is that the Holy Spirit did not choose to reveal who touched him in this situation. Now listen, he's fully God, and he's fully man, but what some of us don't realize, the Bible says in Philippians that he, Jesus emptied himself of divinity and took on humanity. That the life he lived as the son of man on earth, he lived as a man fully equipped with the Holy Spirit. And he only did and said what the Father told him to say and only did what the Holy Spirit told him to do. So there were, there were other situations where the Holy Spirit revealed to him. There was a situation where, do you remember where the man was, was brought up from the, from the roof and the friends lowered him down? And he's like, he looks at their faith and he's like, son, your sins are forgiven. And there was Pharisees that were in the crowd and they just think to themselves in their heart. They say, oh, what? Who? Wh he doesn't have the authority to do this. What gives him the authority to forgive sin? And Jesus, remember, he says, why do you say in your hearts, who is this man that he has the authority to forgive sins. So, so the Holy Spirit did then and would many times reveal things to Jesus, but he didn't reveal this, chose to not reveal who touched him. And, there, and here's, here's why. This, this person, this woman, did not need to be exposed like the Pharisees. She, she needed to step out from the crowd herself. She needed to on her own. See, God is not going to expose you and force you out of the crowd. He'll just come into the garden like God and say, where are you? Where are you? Where are you, Adam? Where are you? Hey, where are you? Who touched me? Who touched me? And he's not going to force you out. He's not going to force He's not. He doesn't want to expose you. He's inviting your fractured identity to come into a space where you can actually be whole. Where are you? Where are you? Who touched me? Who touched me? And he searches, who touched me? She's hiding in the crowd. Who touched me? Who touched me? In verse 33, she finally comes. We don't know how long, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. 
trembling with fear. Notice this is the reason why she didn't come, which is the reason why so many people stay in the crowd and are content with just getting their Sunday checklist, content with getting a word from God, content with getting their little touch and leaving in the crowd and never coming out from the crowd because you're afraid of being exposed. And she comes with fear, trembling, and she told him the whole truth. She heard, she thought, she came, she touched, and she told. And not just part of the story. She didn't give him the cliff note version of the story. She told him the whole truth. She, she went, look, I, I believe she went through the whole, hey, there were supposed to be some people that were going to care for me, and they lied to me. They took everything from me, and now I'm worse off than I started. And, and, and people, what they call me and how they treat me. And, and, and she goes and tells the whole truth. And maybe you heard, and you thought, and you came, and you touched. But until you tell the whole truth, you may walk away with the healing, but you never get the transformation. And Jesus is inviting you so much deeper so much fuller, so much more complete. Jesus led her in this moment to a public confession. Can you imagine that? Inviting her to step out from this crowd and to, to publicly confess the whole truth. Why? Why did Jesus do this? It's not in your notes. But in Revelation chapter 12, we are told that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. That there is power in your public confession. The expression of your faith in your words and your actions is a black eye to the eye of the adversary. The, so in the New Testament, later after Jesus would be resurrected, in the New Testament, the public confession of your transformation is called baptism. That's the, that's the moment where you step out from the crowd of, being, of existing in the crowd of a fan of Jesus and you become a follower of Jesus. And you go all in publicly confessing your faith. I love what Acts chapter 22 verse 16 says. It says, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So she got her healing, but Jesus wasn't done with her. He went searching for her. Come, come. No, where are you? Where are you? Where are you who touched me? Share yourself in Christ. And number four is no yourself in Christ. Know yourself. This woman tried to figure out her issue. What did the doctor say? I don't know what's going on with me. Doc, do you know? What about this doctor? What about this doctor? What about this doctor? You know, like, like you know exactly what WebMD says about your symptoms. You know what I mean? But you don't know what God is saying to you. We know so much about our issue and so little about our identity. In Christ. We know so much about our wounds and not enough about the word of God. We know so much about other people and not enough about our own heart. Knowledge, knowing. Knowing didn't help her. She had more knowledge, but that didn't heal her. Knowledge didn't heal her. I was reading this, the biography of George Wesley. He was a 1700 preacher, preacher from the 1700s. And he, was, he wrote a letter to, um, Charles Wesley wrote a letter to George Whitfield, Whitfield who is another 1700 theologian and professor, preacher, they actually grew up together, started preaching together, and then as they grew up and older and they, they kind of, their theological differences separated them. And in this letter that Charles Wesley wrote George Whitfield, it so touched my heart, he said this, we loved more when we knew less. We loved more when we knew less. The Apostle Paul says it like this, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. See, knowledge can't heal you. Knowledge, knowledge did not heal her. See, and when your knowledge grows without love and you live from a place of knowledge about what you know, and that's the most important thing to you, what you know, what you believe, what you think, it tends to divide you from other people. What they know, what you know, what you believe, what, you, what they believe, what the, you think and what they think. But God doesn't call us. God says, let love be your, your greatest aim. To live from a center of, of love, not of knowledge. Now, Proverbs says, get knowledge, seek understanding, but knowledge did not help this woman get better. The King James Version of this story is what you probably, many people know her name as. She was simply called the woman with the issue of blood. How would you like that for a name? She was identified by her issues. Doesn't that suck to be identified by your issues? To be identified by your past, by your labels? by your stain, by your shame. 
But just as people identify you with your issues, they can also identify you with your position and achievements, like Jairus. So what about you? What about you? Do you define yourself by your emotions? Do you, find, do you define yourself by your status? Do you define yourself by your lowest point? Do you define yourself by your highest achievement? All of that is dangerous. The moment you think you are what you do or you are what you went through, it creates something on the inside, a bleeding on the inside. When your sense of self-worth flows from what you do and what you go through, this woman comes to Jesus afraid, thinking she's going to be punished. Jesus tells, she tells Jesus the whole truth. And then in verse 34, he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. But she was already free from her suffering. Remember verse 29, it says immediately when she touched him, she was set free from her suffering. She felt the difference inside of her. Why in the world did Jesus go through all the trouble? Who touched me? Who touched me? Who touched me? Looking, 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 just to bring this woman back to tell her something she already knew? It wasn't what he told her. It was what he called her. Daughter. Daughter. I know, look, I... I know Jairus' daughter is dying actually right now, but I got another daughter right now who doesn't know she's a daughter. Daughter, do you know who you are in Christ? You are not, listen, daughter, you are not your stain. You are not your shame. You are not your temptation. I am not my mistakes. I am not my habits. I'm not my sin. I'm not my flesh. I'm not my pattern. When she heard about Jesus, she was freed from her suffering. But when she heard from Jesus, she, would free, she was freed from her shame. Do you know who you are in Christ? Or are you content to just exist in the crowd, get a kernel from the kingdom, and sneak away when he's calling you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Do you know who you are in Christ? Let me tell you. Let me just give you three things that the Bible says. And I got a lot of verses here. I'm just going to just read these quickly. Who you are in Christ. Knowing who you are in Christ will change your life. The Bible says, in Christ, I am significant. I am not my past. I'm not who they say I am. I'm not my wounds in Christ. I am significant. The Bible says I am the salt and light of the earth, that I have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 says I am God's temple. I am a minister of reconciliation for God. Ephesians 2.10 says I am God's workmanship. And Philippians 4.13 says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am significant in Christ. Do you know who you are in Christ? In Christ, not only are you significant, write this down. In Christ, I am secure. This world can be shaken. People can shake. This the economy can shake. But in Christ, I am secure. It's, it's my position. It's my identity. I am free. The Bible says in Romans 8, forever from condemnation. I am assured all things work together for good. I am free from any charge against me. I cannot be separated from the love of God. I am established, anointed, and sealed by God by the power of the Holy Spirit. I am a citizen of heaven. I am born of God, and the evil one can't even touch me. I am secure in Christ. Do you know, do you know who you are in Christ? You're, you're significant, you're secure, and you are accepted. The Bible says, I am Christ's friend. I have been justified. I am a member of Christ's body. I am a saint. I'm not a sinner. Ephesians 1 says, I'm a saint of God. Colossians 1 says, I have been redeemed and forgiven. Colossians 2.10 says, I am complete in Christ. And John 1.12 says, I am God's child. I am a son of God. You are a daughter. You are a son. It's in Christ that we find who I am and what I'm living for. I'm significant. I'm secure. I'm accepted. And if you don't find that in Christ, you'll try to find it in other things and in other people. And instead of getting better, you'll only get worse. And you'll hurt other people in the process. So maybe, maybe the solution to our relationship rehab is getting ourselves into rehab. Maybe the problem isn't so much with them because you can't control them anyway. Maybe God wants to do something inside of you. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. 
You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.